Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. HeroesCon 2019 took place the third weekend in June. As always, the organizers put together an amazing collection of writers and artists from comic books, newspaper strips, and web comics. From the annual art auction, cosplay contest, dozens of vendors, and panels, fans were treated to what is considered to be the best pure comics convention in the world. I was invited to moderate a panel on crowdfunding and brought the comic culture cameras to the Charlotte Convention Center to record and share it with you. Crowdfunding is uh, really kind of an amazing thing that's happened in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, which is basically, thanks to the internet, creators are able to connect directly with uh, their fans who are potentially consumers to get stories out that instead of going to a traditional publisher, they're able to sell directly to you, know, you rather than trying to get a publisher to look at a return on investment or say, well, why is this little story so... Um, uh, worth our uh, attention or our time to publish. Uh, on the panel with me today is Ron Randall. He is uh, the creative force behind Trekker. We have the force behind Assassin Roommates, uh, Monica Gallagher. <laughs> we have Black Phoenix creator Rich Tommaso. And to his right, we have the lovely and talented Daryl Banks, whose current project is Harkins Raiders. And joining us now, <laughs> sorry. Making, sorry. A, making a seamless entrance into the panel is Carl Kiesel, who has uh, worked on two uh, Kickstarters in the past year uh, for Section Zero and is currently working on one for, is it Impossible Jones? Impossible Jones, yeah. So I, I'm glad I worked that in there. It was a seamless plug. So I guess my first question to all of you, and I'll, I'll sort of address you one-on-one, uh, -on -one. why not just go to a publisher? I know I alluded to uh, maybe they're going to be looking at some profit and loss statements, but, but you know, if you've got a property like Trekker, why wouldn't you just so go to um, you know, DC and say, hey, how about you let me start publishing this? I did. Uh, I, I, I was doing Trekker through Dark Horse for, for quite a few years, um, and I would still happily be using Dark Horse as my publishing partner on Trekker, uh, except for one thing. They were great to work with as far as uh, creative input. They, they gave me all, you know, it was my creation, and I have the copyright and everything for Trekker. That's why I called them my publishing partner. Uh, the only problem I came to have with them was the, I, I wanted the books to come out at a, at a certain frequency at a certain rate and we couldn't get our our, our publication scheduling uh, to, to line up properly um, it was taking too long for the next books to be coming out it wasn't doing a good service to my series or to the readers so finally I decided well I guess I better try Kickstarter and see if I can fund it with backing from the from the readers um, and get this book to come out on the schedule I think the book and the readers deserve so that's that's in a nutshell why I've, why I turned to Kickstarter. Okay. It was an act of desperation. <laughs> <laughs> and Monica, you are working with Webtoon on uh, Assassin Roommate, uh -huh. and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you said that you have a, um, hopefully a collection coming out soon, so why use uh, Kickstarter to get people to help get that started? Uh, I think it's, it's really fun to involve people in your project, so um, Kickstarter's great because you're basically like pre-ordering the book, but then you get all this extra stuff and you get to be part of like making it happen. So I think that's like the fun of Kickstarter for the most part is like you're all doing it. Ooh, you're all doing it together. Um, so it's much more of like a community platform kind of yeah. kind of situation. Is that something that's important to you? Because I guess being a creator, it's, it's sort of solitary work. You're in a studio by yourself a lot of times. So is that right. community that support getting you to hit those deadlines? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it definitely helps if people are like waiting and expecting something from you that's <laughs> rather than it's just you by yourself putting stuff out there and you're like I'm not sure if anyone's reading this yeah it definitely lights a fire under you and uh, now Rich you've done a, both Kickstarters and you're on Patreon why aren't you just going to a dark horse or an IDW and saying hey I've got this great project um, well I, I, I originally had a different idea for I do like an anthology magazine and those don't really sell and at, at first I tried to get an anthology magazine put together with um, other cartoonists. I had like some Marvel, DC people on board, but it, I was still told like from every publisher that I'd worked on, yeah. like work for hire, they were like, those aren't, those names are still not like big enough to, yeah. to, to publish something like that. And just doing my own work through like Image for a few years, it's, you know, the sales would go up and then they go way down. They're just up and down and it's very stressful when you're trying to just create work. And so I always wanted to try Patreon. I thought if I can get enough people 
like you said, it's just so direct. Everyone that's that's uh, supporting me and that's donating, they're getting the book, and that's all I have to worry about. I don't have to worry about sales or you know distribution really because it won't be on a you know huge scale, and mm -hmm. and so uh, that's why I thought, oh, just do it, just do it through Patreon. And Is it difficult for you to stay in touch with your supporters? I mean, how how are you using uh, I guess email and social media to keep them engaged? Beyond? Well, I have uh, for each different tier. Like, there's a specific tier to get the magazine, and so like they have everyone broken up in tiers. So yeah, I can like email, kind of mass email everybody any kind of information that everyone has to know. They also provide you with that person's like personal email if they provide it on Patreon. I can get in touch with them individually if I have to, if I, if I lose some. I'm still waiting for two people's addresses. <laughs> I don't know why they're like, don't you want this book? It's fairly easy. I think the having their email addresses is more helpful because not too many people are going to the site you know, every day, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you kind of miss them trying to message people that way. But, and social media helps. A lot of pe people I know personally, a lot of people I know them through Facebook or Instagram, so I'll just get in touch with them that way if I have to. Mm -hmm. And Daryl, uh, your recent project is Harkins Raiders. Correct. Um, and this was something that, uh, in addition to the Kickstarter, this is part of Ominous Press. So I'm wondering, uh, why doesn't Ominous just publish this on their own? Well, also, see, Ominous Press, I like the fact that they have a good business model and partnership with Kickstarter, especially with the subject matter being World War II. We're not really sure, you know, would that be a, a good risk to just go ahead and do it through them? Because they, they had such a good track, track record using Kickstarter as a way to get uh, different type of uh, publications out there. So that way, we know that everyone that supports it are uh, interested in the subject matter. Uh, it's, it's, it's not nonfiction, it's, it's still a fictional story in a nonfictional environment, but that way we, we could track who's actually interested and also making the, all the partners feel like they're a part of something so that they feel like they're on the ground floor or something, especially considering uh, what we're pouring into it. So, uh, so yeah, and also I, what I like working with Ominous Press's model with Kickstarters, I get my first art book. I've never had those before, so it was a win-win for me. But uh, other than that, I, th I think rather than them just going ahead and trying it themselves, that way you kind of limit the risk. You'll know, okay, this is someone something that people will be interested in. And Carl, um, I, I'm proud to be in the first uh, collection of Section Zero. Uh, and I know that you just wrapped up the Kickstarter for the second Section Zero, but this is a, a property that had been published before, and now you're doing it on your own. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, again, you know, why, why not just go to DC and say, you know, we've got a proven track record, let's, let's publish this. Section Zero, you know, when we brought it back on and Kickstarter, had not been around for 17 years, so you know, there's no way to really say it was, a, you know, for most fans today, it's an, un an unknown property. Really, there's there's a, a number that remember it more than I, I thought, quite honestly. But um, I don't think it's the sort of thing that DC or Marvel or even Image would look at and say, I think we can make a profitable book out of this. Um, not right now. I mean, our first Kickstarter was a squeaker. We barely made our, and, and granted, we had a pretty high goal. We were trying to raise 65000 but we didn't raise a quarter of that till the last day. Our second, our second <laughs> Kickstarter, once we'd proven we could do it, you know, yeah, we funded that and had some, uh, and overfunded by a, a nice sizable margin. So I mean, I, I think it now, now maybe someone like uh, Image might be interested, but, uh, and we do have a, a deal with Image where they serialize our, our hardcover book, so we're, we're trying to do almost like a uh, classic book book publishing model where the hardcover comes out and then a year later Image will serialize it. Image doesn't pay, at least would not pay me money up front, and for us to produce the book we need money up front, and that's what Kickstarter supplies us with. It, they supply us with the money so we can pay our bills so we can make the comics. I guess that leads to the, the question I guess the consumer might have is, well if you're just going to publish the book in the future why do I have to support it now? But it's actually helping the creators afford yeah. things like electricity and, and food, <laughs> little things like which little things. I'm a big fan of. <laughs> and you know, if, if the image serialization does not sell, they're not going to keep doing it. So really, Kickstarter, that's our bread and butter. I mean, I will say, 
last week, just before I came out here, Jim Valentino said he was going to send me a check for the first issue of Section Zero Through Image. That check could be for ten dollars. I, I really don't know what it's going to be for. <laughs> yeah. He he said it's not selling phenomenal, so I'm not expecting a big check from Image. Our bread and butter money is from Kickstarter. That's what makes it possible. Uh, I guess another thing we could talk about is the extra work that goes into it, which are like the stretch goals. And I know you have one on your arm. Uh, two. Um, I have two. I've, I have skin in the game. So <laughs> every time I have a successful Kickstarter, I've vowed to get a, a tattoo. First successful, successful Kickstarter, section zero. Second successful Kickstarter, section zero. And uh, I now am kickstarting Impossible Jones, and she'll go right over here <laughs> if, if it gets funded. You guys can def you guys can make that happen. <laughs> so. so when it comes to the, the stretch goals and the, the freebie giveaway, I guess they wouldn't be freebie giveaways, but you know, if I were to uh, reach a certain level of support, I could expect you know, maybe some sketches or some temporary tattoos or something like that. So uh, how do you come up with what's going to be that stretch goal? Uh, how do you kind of make it work with the story that you're trying to produce? And, and how do you find the time? Well, I mean, a lot of it just comes down to your own personal taste. I mean, that's the beauty of Kickstarter, and, and I, I really do try to structure my Kickstarters to reflect me and my partners, Tom Grummet on Section Zero and David Hahn on uh, Impossible Jones. I, and it is, like everyone has been saying, that direct connection. I think when people read my Kickstarters and see what we offer as, uh, as rewards, it really ref reflects our sensibilities, not the corporate sensibilities of Marvel and DC, which are not necessarily bad, but they may not be exactly mine. Uh, in a, you know, on Section Zero, one of the uh, rewards I offered each time was uh, to be a member of the team. You could get drawn in as a member. Now, that's because I knew the story and I knew one member of the team was going to die horribly. <laughs> so we've had two people who don't mind being killed horribly. Uh, and on Impossible Jones, uh, I've offered up henchmen. You can be one of three henchmen for a, a criminal mastermind scheming to take over something. And, you know, henchmen, who doesn't want to be a henchman? <laughs> you know? And, I, and once again, this reflects my personal sensibility very directly and I think that's part of the personal connection with the fans and, and the backers and Daryl now you you've done art for other people's Kickstarters yes. as, as a stretch goal so uh, I'm wondering you know again on Harkins Raiders how are you finding the time to do the pages to do all the extra work and, and I guess make it all well happen? In, in the case of Harkins Raiders this the story is, is, is now complete so we're doing all the stretch goals after the fact but we, we, we tailored it based on the subject matter what we were working on. For example, since it's a, a World War II military story, one of the, the main uh, generals was talking about uh, some information he had gathered and he had photographs of persons of interest. Well, one of the goals is you could be, you know, like when I drew it, it was just blank and it's like you can put, like your photo, not photo, your, uh, your face could go here, that sort of thing. So it, it was part of the story, that sort of thing. And then also, like I mentioned before, the, the art book was part of, uh, was, a, was a goal. And just uh, other artwork, you know, commissions like I do ordinarily. So, you know, as you know with Kickstarter, there are tiers. But we, we wanted to make sure we had at least some stretch goals that related to the project because like I said, we weren't sure how hard of a sell this was going to be, so to keep that interest, because that's what I like about Kickstarter is that direct connection yeah, you know, with, exactly. with, with your audience. So those that have the interest in this particular genre, you can be a part of that. So uh, we were thankful that we had a lot of support with it. So you know, we, when you're choosing it, it's going to be it's going to differ from project to project. But I think it's always good to have something that relates to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think some of the goals have been like you know, Daryl will draw one of the characters of your choice. So is that something where you might be dipping into your your work at Marvel or DC and and you know doing a, a Kyle Rayner or something like that? Oh yeah, I mean that was a part of it, but we kind of knew that you know that was a given. But we also wanted to make sure we had something that directly, like, to circle them back around to, okay, well, th this isn't a superhero story, but yeah, we, we knew that had to be a, you know, part of one of the goals, but uh, we didn't hype it as much, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I think more people went for the commissions than having their picture of the story, because I think we got two people for that, but everybody else wanted the, the commission, but uh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, Rich, uh, I know that with the, the Patreon, you're doing, um, 
I guess, giving people looks into the work as you're doing it. So just what sort of things do you give your supporters so that way they feel like they're involved and part so of the process? So the way I set it up, um, because it, I had done the Kickstarter in like 2009, so I kind of thought of that as like, I remembered it as a one and done kind of thing, and then as I was hearing about Patreon, it seemed like more of like, well, this is just people that are supporting you while you work. They're not really looking for like, you're not having to give them like tons of rewards. So I kind of just based it on like, well, you can look at preliminary art, and as each tier goes higher, and it, um, you can see like finished work, and I'll just maybe write about the process of it. It's, it's kind of like you get to see the production of the magazine when you go to the when you go to the website. So, because uh, that was the other thing I wanted just the blog itself to be a little bit more interesting. And so you actually will see like the front cover, the inside cover, the credits page is all, all of that. So you kind of feel like you're part of the production of this magazine, like page by page. Um, as far as the stretch goals, I feel like I have to keep coming up with different things. I had the magazine. And then I had an idea for like an original art goal of something that would be, you know, higher price. So there were a couple of people that are doing that. But I feel like that's something that's ongoing with me, where I'm constantly trying to think of, well, what else could I add? Because mm -hmm. because it's ongoing, and because it's not just one book, it will, I'll, you know, be publishing issue after issue of these things. I feel like I have to keep trying to come up with new things to, to, to get people interested in it again and, and to get more and to get new patrons. And, and that's got to be uh, just a lot of work as well, just trying to come up with that next thing that you're going to keep them engaged with. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of space between that. Like, it took me a while to even think of, like, oh, maybe I should have an original art uh, goal. And so, yeah, because I'm so busy working on the content, a lot of that, you know, it doesn't come that often, like ideas for things like that. But there's like a seven dollar go where you get a PDF of the book, and it, it felt like when I added that on, there was like a significant amount of new patrons when I added that mm -hmm. as well. It's just something I, because I was so busy on the book, my wife was like, "Why don't you add like a PDF <laughs> thing to that tier?" And you can always go back in and, you know, rewrite these tiers. So doing that, I got a lot more people. So. Why, wives Busy. often come up with the best ideas. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Like, why didn't no I? doubt about <laughs> it. No doubt about it. <laughs> and Monica, now, uh, you also have a Patreon, and you have done the Kickstarter. So I know on, on your Patreon you will do, um, I guess, uh, comics for just your supporters. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering what sort of things you're doing and how you're sort of reaching out and coming up with new exciting things. Um, that's always, it's always a struggle, um, trying to come up with stuff because, uh, different people just want to support you so they just want to like you know appreciate because when I used to have a webcomic for free it was nice because it made sense people were just paying me because I was doing it for free um, so I appreciated that but now it's like what do you guys want do you want sketches do you want like what do you want me to do like for you um, so it's always a thing where a lot of us creators on Patreon always feel like we don't know what to do so we're always asking each other like what are you what are you offering like how are you arranging it and then um, for Kickstarter, though, I've only done one Kickstarter, but I always heard that um, the stretch goals should be making the book better. Like, so then you don't have to stress out about like offering other stuff if you don't want to. So it's like, oh, if I get here, then it'll be hardcover. Or if I get here, it'll have French flaps or whatever. And that kind of uh, takes away a lot of the stress of like, what else can I offer? Um, so that's, a, I mean, that's a good idea if you really don't have anything in mind um, specifically for stretch goals. But I am going to be part of a Kickstarter, which is funny, um, later this year that someone's running for me. And um, they sent me their like default stretch goals. And one was like dinner with the creator. I'm like, what? No. <laughs> no. Oh, and then worse than that was like an hour phone call. I was like, no. <laughs> I would never offer that. It was like my nightmare. Like, anyone can call me, and I have to talk to them for an hour. <laughs> you know, you could do a job interview. That's always yeah, less exactly, pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so don't do that. I wouldn't recommend that. That's a weird one. And Ron, what have you found works for you? A lot of what Monica said is true. The, my campaigns uh, structures, the, the, the initial few stretch goals are all enhancing the book, adding extra pages to the book, extra content, which I'm able to generate from <laughs> Uh, a lot of like process stuff, you know, like here's the pencils of a page and the inks and then the colored. So work that I've already done, I can just sort of format that and add a section of work that way. Sometimes it'll gallery some of the commissions that I've done over the course of the last year or two. Um, so content that I already have in one form, I just format it and that's that's a way to add some more, some more uh, content for the book without a ton of extra effort on my part. 
Um, and a lot of readers do like that, those glimpses behind the curtain of the creative process and that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, spot uh, cover varnish, something I would never have thought of doing, but uh, I heard people say that's, that's a real popular thing to add, and, and I love it now that I'm doing it. <laughs> um, so things like that. Um, I try to make the book uh, as special as I can, uh, but I also try to, to keep um, the stretch goal rewards from, from having a lot of mission creep about them. Uh, it's easy to, to think of all these shiny, attractive baubles that you could, you know, a coffee mug. Um, or, you know, <laughs> the clothes and a pens are very popular. But everything that you do there, you have to realize not only does it increase the cost, but also the complexity of your campaign. And uh, what I'm doing with Trekker is, is it's a series of trade paperbacks that I want to have come out on a regular schedule. And everything that adds to the time involvement in preparing and fulfilling the campaigns affects how the frequency at which I can do my books. And if you remember when I was first talking about the reason I'm not doing it at Dark Horse is the interval of time between books was unacceptable to me. So I need to run my campaigns in, in a kind of a stripped down, efficient and smooth running way as I can do. Uh, so manufacturing a lot of really cool sounding extras to dump on, lump onto the campaign increases manufacturing complexity, shipping complexity, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I really, I will, one thing that, that is often suggested for people if you're going to run a Kickstarter is back a lot of other Kickstarters. Because when you do that, you can see what other people are doing. Uh, you can get some ideas from them. But don't take every good idea you see because it may not fit your particular mm -hmm. situation and the sort of Kickstarter project you're doing. So, um, so I do look around. Carl was Carl helped me set up my first Kickstarter, and without Carl, I don't think it would have succeeded. And I got a lot of great ideas from Carl. And what Carl is doing with Section Zero and Impossible Jones is somewhat different than what I'm doing with Becker. Mm -hmm. So not everything that I do is going to work for Carl and vice versa. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So you have to build your own campaign and look at what your prod project, your product is, and what your objectives are, and what your own work capacity is, too, because all this stuff takes time. Yeah. And I did not get into comic books to sell comic books. <laughs> but that's what you have to do when you're doing something like this. You're, you're the marketing department. You're the distribution department. You're dealing with the printers, all that sort of stuff. I do it because I'm very passionate about my book. And I want to share these stories with readers. And this is the best way I can do to get the book out in a way that that I can hold my head up high about. But I have to be very careful about all the decisions I make that are going to affect my time and energy. Well, I guess that, that leads to the, the next point. We could do this sort of round robin. I do want to know uh, a little bit about the organization um, you know, uh, that goes into a campaign. Not only are you working on the, the book, but you're also working on the stretch goals. You're working on making sure that you can get everything done on time. Or in your case, Rich, you're working on something quarterly. So you've always got to be working on something and, and engaging. And so I spent two months just thinking about the tiers, like just, just kind of mm -hmm. writing it and like leaving it as a draft. and. Because it was very tricky just to think about what would be fair for each mm -hmm. payment here and, and how to really present what I was doing. It, the other thing, too, is it's difficult because it, was, it wasn't a monthly thing. It was something that I was trying to explain. Well, every four months you would get this book because I, again, I don't want to be, I can't do a 50-page book every month. Yeah. So, you know, it took me a while just to, like, figure all that. And I did look at other people's patrons. But, again, some people's don't work. Even cartoonists work in, in the same way, exactly. depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, like, just take some time and just, because you can leave these as draft, you don't have to put them out there right. for a while. You can just keep going in there and, and mm -hmm. just working, uh, you know, just figuring things out and changing some things around. So. It seems like, too, there's, there's many different ways that things work. You, you wait until you have a complete book uh, before you start, I guess, soliciting it through Kickstarter, whereas you're using, uh, Carl, you're using that as a way to support what you're doing while yeah. you're working on the book. Yeah, there's no other way I could uh, afford to, you know, I simply can't afford to finish off a book before I kickstart it or hand it off to Image or what. I've got, you know, that would take months of my life, and I've, you know, I can't talk to the electric company and say, I'll pay you in four months. <laughs> you know, if, if my Kickstarter works. If my Kickstarter works, yeah. yeah. I can't so afford to do that. Yeah. It sounds like <laughs> Kickstarter and Patreon are That's very you want to similar. Get it's, it's people are, you know, they're, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to help you as you work on the book. It's not, you know, it's not so much based on, I have to post every day or I have to, like, offer, like, all these other things. And, you know, they're doing this because they want to support you as you, as you work. It's, it seems like they're both like that now, mm -hmm. whether it's Kickstarter or Patreon. Mm -hmm. so. And I'm imagining that, that those two uh, organizations have... 
I guess, things that they can suggest that you try. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I've never done a Kickstarter. I'm not on Patreon. So is there anything you could share that, that they've helped you with or pointed well, you in the right they, direction? they have suggested that I uh, offer dinner with people, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I actually did offer on, I think, the last section there, and no one took it. <laughs> and, you know, and quite honestly, like you, I was not sold on the idea, but like someone at Kickstarter that I respected said, this is a good idea, and so why not give it a try? It wasn't a good fit for me. Yeah. And obviously was not something my readers were interested in. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely think of creators that I would definitely pay to go to dinner. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that would be fun and obnoxious, but I would never <laughs> <laughs> offer that for me. I've been told that making a video, like posting videos seems to get a lot of people right. interested, yeah. which is something... Said. I've done a couple of times. It's kind of hard to do, but but uh, it goes along with the process. Like with, you know, as, as opposed to just seeing the pencils or inks, to actually take videos of you inking or something. It really gets a lot of people mm -hmm. to just look at what you're doing. And yeah, you really have to develop new skills. The, the whole video thing is so foreign to me. I did it with like the phone in one hand. <laughs> <laughs> I almost screwed up this panel because I'm like, how do you do this? I guess the Go, I guess the GoPros are not super expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm always trying to figure out like, so where do I put this like yeah. computer or my phone? While I'm <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so it seems like there's a lot of of time that just not working on the art that you're just kind of trying to come up with a new way to brain, you brainstorm. Yeah. So how do you schedule that? Because, you know, if you're trying to get a book out, uh, whether it's, you know, 32 pages or 64 pages or 148 pages, how do you sort of schedule that time? Because I know for me, if I have something to do and I don't necessarily have a deadline, I'm going to probably eat some chips. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to say most of my ideas outside of working on the book come at like three in the morning. <laughs> and I'll wake up and go, oh, that's an idea I could do. You know, I mean, it, it's just always brewing in the back of your head is what it comes down to. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a specific answer for how do you go about scheduling the time, but, but it, it's super important that you are very, as I was saying before, protective of your time. And you have to be very intentional about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you, and you, you have to try to estimate how long each job is going to take and then double it and add half again. Um, and you, it's, it's so easy to let the, the tail start to wag the dog here. You know, um, theoretically what we're, we're doing is we want to write and, write and draw these stories. And if we spend all of our time building campaigns and coming up with new ideas, um, which are cool and fun and exciting to think about, but uh, the execution can take a long time. So um, I, I just I have to allocate a certain amount of time for drawing, and I try to set that a time that side of time in as big a chunk as possible, because the, the more I can work uninterruptedly on one on one task, the more the more productive I can be at that. And I and I do start planning and thinking about the next campaign months before I'm going to launch the campaign and start to assemble ideas and I have <laughs> I have several little clipboards full of notes and um, about this you know ideas for rewards and, and ideas for stretch goals and, and price points and all that sort of stuff um, I sort of have to let stuff, that stuff sort of percolate along and, and let ideas come when they will um, and then keep track of where all my notes are at. <laughs> What if you, if you could talk to, this is one of those terrible questions. Uh, if you could talk to yourself when you first, from now to when you did your you first yeah. Kickstarter Patreon. I like how conversations with myself. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so what, what advice would you give yourself? Definitely like think about it more and plan before. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to, when I do any project, I'm like, I do a little bit of planning and then I'm like, let's just do it. Yeah, let's just like see how it works. Um, but the nice thing about Patreon is that it's not like set it and forget it like Kickstarter. You ha you can constantly evolve it. So the more that you learn, you can keep like adjusting things. Except I got to the point where I really liked my video, and now I don't want to do another one. So I don't know if I'll ever update it because <laughs> it was such a pain in the ass. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's nice that it's an evolution. So you don't have to feel like, oh, I can never launch it because it's not perfect. I guess that's not really advice to myself. I'm like, just do it the same way, it'll be fine. <laughs> Everything takes longer than you expect. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And I think Ron was right. You've got to think how long it'll take you and double it, and, and even a little more. And, and I'll admit, I'm still not good at that. <laughs> I think if I focus more on the work than, than posting and things like that, it, uh, even like really close friends, they're not reading this stuff online, it turns out. They're not going and looking at this art that I'm putting up like almost every day. And, and you know, again, my wife was like, you don't have to post every day. Mm -hmm. These are people that are supporting you because they love your work. I'm like, just work on the book, you know, because that's the tough thing to get done. And that's the thing ultimately that they want to see, you know, like 
even people that are visiting the site are liking things. You know, when I actually got the book all done, they were like, oh, I can't wait to read it. And I was like, they're not reading this online. <laughs> so I think, yeah, focusing more on work and not stressing out about, oh, I have to put something up there like every other day to, you know. And, and not to be stressed out when there are delays, but it's because I think if you are working with a larger pub publisher, non-Kickstarter, mm -hmm. they have solicitations and things that have hard deadlines, yeah. whereas yeah. I think with Kickstarter and I would imagine with Patreon, it's a little bit more organic, you've got a little bit more wiggle room. Plus, since we're talking supporters, there are people that, as long as you keep them in the loop, they'll understand. Yeah. You know, I think the key is don't have any of your supporters in the dark. If, if there's a yeah, delay, definitely. tell them. I, I feel that, you know, the, the, It'll make it, it'll cut down your stress, at least it, hopefully it will, and then that way you can keep going forward without thinking the axe is going to fall, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were dealing with a publisher, you know, they have to have things solicited with Diamond and at certain points in time, I think. But with Kickstarter, you've got a little bit more uh, a, a, an organic nature to your production. Yeah. And I, I, another question is, um, you've all had successful campaigns. I'm sure there are many campaigns that are not successful. And it could, not, it could be that the story was terrible, or it could be that the story was great, but the execution of the campaign wasn't necessarily uh, the best. So if you were talking to somebody who um, doesn't have a social media presence or somebody who wants to start a, a Kickstarter campaign and is asking for a million billion dollars on their first uh, try, what, what sort of advice would you give them just to maybe point them in the right direction? Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, try to figure Why out. Why do they want to hide If you don't, if you if you don't have, <laughs> least you can do if you don't have a, a pretty good social media following or some sort of some sort of a following for for the thing that you want to be selling, it's it's very difficult to do if you're asking for. I mean, try to have a realistic goal in mind, but. but um, it's just hard to do, you know. I, I think it's like somebody who has a great idea for a comic book, and then they'll get the whole comic book done, and then try to find a publisher for it. That's that's yeah. the one in a million shot, sort of, you know. I worked for a couple of years trying to get some sort of social media media following before I ever launched a Kickstarter, but I knew that was my goal. But uh, yeah, I mean, if if there's no one out there listening to you, it doesn't matter what you say, you know. That's another reason to back other people, um, yes. because the community is really important. So not just to steal their ideas, but also like... We say borrow. <laughs> borrow. <laughs> Rebrand their the ideas, <laughs> if you will, yeah. But, um, but also because then you can hype each other up, and it's yeah. so much easier yeah. to promote someone else's oh, work absolutely. than your own. That yes, is that's a very a good benefit. point. Yeah. 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 I'm wondering if we wanted to turn over and, and see if anyone out here has any questions that we could ask this learned panel. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Kind of a, from the fans' side of things. Uh, Darren, Darren, Darren and I are Ron's, but we've been in Ron's books at this high level, but it's not the bonus source. And the thing that's really rewarding as a fan is I put my wife in Ron's first Kickstarter, I put me in the second one, I bought a commission from Ron before all of this. I haven't spent as much money as if I had gone to a art dealer and got like, Alex Ross limited edition print that he never touched. Mm -hmm. And so here I'm sitting with stuff that's just got geek crib to the end. I really enjoy it. It's support that what I, what I love. And to me, I'm also, I, I was craft beer before it was cool. This is the equivalent to me of going to a local brewer and buying a brow. I spend 20 bucks on that brow, I know that local brewer is getting 10, 12. I go buy a case of Anheuser, the guy can't even say he ain't got a yeah. yeah. So it's that, it's that connection, and it just it feels good. And to me, as a collector, as, as a fan, people say, well, you, you spend a lot. No, it was a bargain. Because what I put in and what I get out are made for the Incognito and And it just it makes you feel like you're part of the process. Realistically, as opposed to, oh, come on, yeah, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it really, it's been incredibly rewarding. And then, like today, I was telling Ron, the other day, I was a voiceover artist, still am. I said, you ever want to do a promo video, don't pay for your video. I will, I will mail you the file. But it just needs to really kind of get behind it. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll actually uh, come on and off the box out and say, too, and I'm a little bit of a because that's what Monte Carlo both been very good about building a community. It's not just a social media presence, but they have this personal connection that you end up 
really part of, and then you end up having a personal connection with other backers, just like Scott and I did. That's how we met through the fans of Ron and uh, supporting his Kickstarter. But now, you know, we're friends. You get to make those connections and create that community, and it's really nice. That's something that you never get through buying a book at the, at the shop where you yeah, I do think it's a little more direct. I mean, if we're all X-Men fans, it's it's still not the same as if you're all you, if you guys are Trekker fans. There's there's something much more direct about it, and and it makes the bond, I think, a lot stronger. <laughs> yeah, it's it's almost like a sports team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How do you feel is the best way to mobilize your fan base once you develop something? We've got a webcomic we do, and we have a decent number of followers, not great, but how do you find the best way to actually mobilize people to come to a Kickstarter or your Patreon? We do postings and talk to them, however, it doesn't seem to be gaining so much traction. So how would you recommend to actually get that? Yeah, I think um, if you can do anything like a conversation rather than posting like links or anything like that, because I think people are so oversaturated with like, check out my thing, check out my thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that helps. We have a table here. We benefit more whenever we have a conversation with people. Definitely. Always because you mentioned fostering that community. We all have a love of comics. It's why we come to conventions. It's why we come to these panels. So I'm just, how do you find a way to translate that online, the conversation sometimes loses a bit of its personality whenever it is online, and it's very impersonal, rather than coming to the show, meeting the artist that you're wanting to buy from, and actually purchasing the comic right off them. How, how do you find a way to translate that? I think if you get other people to talk about your webcomic, it'll be more effective than if you talk about mm -hmm. it. You know, if you can get the word out and... I don't know. I, I just think, you know, if I say I'm great, who's going to listen? But if you say I'm great, maybe people will listen, yeah. you know? Carl's great. And, <laughs> and you can, if you have trouble, like, talking to people online like that, you can offer, be like, hey, um, I saw that you had a comic on Kickstarter. Um, would you, you know, if I check yours out, you know, will you, like, check out mine? And, like, if you like it, say something. But don't be like, hey, can you check out my stuff and then talk about it? Just be like, oh, if you, like, offer them something, right. like, show that you looked at their work already and you're a fan or whatever, you like what they're doing, and then see if they'll do the same for you. Um, There's also a lot of, like, groups on Facebook that are just, you know, there's, like, a copper group. There's the indie comics group. Mm -hmm. So I think when you get into that, a lot of those people have actually met each other in real life, and they mm -hmm. talk to each other outside of that group, and that just brings, you know, whatever you're doing into a room of, a virtual room, of a bunch of like-minded people. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way to get people to, you know, to come to your website. Okay, and you, sir, in the back. I guess my question, you know, what I got to thinking in my head was, um, do you have any uh, suggestions or ideas for, you know, groups like Facebook groups or things to deal with the nuts and bolts, like the actual printing? I mean, I live in a really small community. We do not have a printing company that I would trust <laughs> to uh, to do prints for, you know, as far as, like, uh, um, special tiers and things like that. And then when the book actually comes out, you know, you, like a 64 or 80 page book that's going to be bound, you know, you want it to look, you know, as good as something, you know, you're going to get from Marvel or DC at, at the comic shop, and you don't want pages coming out, you want to make sure it's it's top quality, for, you know, but you don't really know where to go. You know, are there any good groups and stuff like that where you can talk to people and get the advice for the nuts and bolts, the actual, you know, material getting the book? Done and um, I think Kickstarter has forums. Yeah, I think there are forums on Kickstarter. And, and again, what we said before, if you're backing a lot of other Kickstarter campaigns, when you get the rewards, see if you like the product. Yeah. If you do, then say, hey, I really love the book that I backed from you on Kickstarter. I'm holding it in my hand right now, and it's really awesome. I'm going to be running a Kickstarter myself. Can I ask you some questions about mm -hmm. how you went about having your books printed? Mm -hmm. uh, reach out to people that you helped. <laughs> yeah. uh, most, uh, in my experience, most of the Kickstarter creators that I'm in touch with are incredibly um, 
supportive of each other. Um, we sort of think that we're all, we know, we recognize that we're all in this same boat together and uh, uh, helping, each, helping another Kickstarter uh, to succeed makes the whole process better for everybody. So mm -hmm. I think you'll probably find a lot of people that are willing to answer those questions and yeah. kickstart itself, and, and especially through the campaigns that you yourself are backing. That's You're putting your money where your mouth is, you're giving them appreciation that's genuine for something they've done, and you're asking for you know, a, just a little bit of information. You don't want to you know, try to bleed them dry of everything they know, but just a couple of questions point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I guess we'll use this as a, an opportunity if anyone has any uh, final comments, uh, anything they'd like to promote, plug, or shamelessly sell. Uh, now would be a great time. Well, well oddly, it's funny you should say that because I am running a Kickstarter right oh. now for Impossible Jones, and you can find it at impossiblekickstarter.com, and uh, it's bas basically about a thief gets superpowers is mistaken for a superhero and she says yeah yeah that's right I'm a superhero <laughs> and uh, hilarity and hijinks en ensue so uh, I'm, I'm really hoping we can get this funded because I really want to get this story out there and uh, so if you want to check that out I would appreciate it well and I'm running a Kickstarter as well uh, my third Trekker Kickstarter and it's at trekkerkickstarter.com so, um, and I'm at, I'm at table 604 Carl's at 603. 603. Six three. Six three. Girls at 605. Six six five. Five. Six five. Six five. At least three of us are, are, are grouped right together. The 666 table. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed a lot of hands went up as far as those that want to do this. And uh, I used to teach. And one thing I used to encounter with my students is they had the talent, they had the ideas, but sometimes they had a lot of self doubt. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. Well, someone's over here could do it, but I couldn't. I just want to just say, yeah, you, you can do this. It won't be easy, but you'll find out, if, especially if you're doing something that you created, have the confidence to know that it'll be worth it. It's going to be hard, but I, it's as cliche as it sounds, you know, if you, if you stick with it, because you'll discover, uh, think about, uh, we were talking about the Marvels and the DCs. Well, uh, last time I checked, Game of Thrones has nothing to do with Marvel or DC Comics. <laughs> the Walking Dead has nothing to do with Marvel or DC Comics. You know what I mean? Your idea could be a big thing that has nothing to do with the things that we associate with success. So keep those things in mind when you find yourself, and you will, like, ah, this isn't worth it. I, I, I don't want to do this. No, stick with it, you know? It, it, and you may discover that the, the time that you spent Every time you wanted to quit and you kept going, and it, it, it'll finally become worth it, you'll, you'll find out how bad you really wanted it. Because, especially with Kickstarter, these are personal things. It's not yeah. something you were hired to do. So I just wanted to put that out there. I saw a lot of hands like, yeah, I want to do it, but chances are, I mean, is, is everyone here confident about what they want to do, or do they have that, eh, I don't know. Well, still, I just wanted to kind of put that out there, because, you know, you, you, even if it doesn't work, doesn't mean, okay, well, I'll never try that again. No, you know, you know I, uh, I don't want to say it, but at first, at first you don't succeed, right. but still, but especially when you're talking about things with Kickstarter where you, it's a personal project, people may not get it at first, at first, but then if, if it becomes big, then they'll have people like, oh yeah, I, was a, I knew it was going to be a successful all along, you know, so uh, hopefully that, that will give you a little something to think about. I don't know if anyone is going to top that. So I'm going to uh, thank all of you for attending this uh, panel. I'd like to thank Carl Kiesel, Daryl Banks, Rich Tommaso, Monica Gallagher, and Ron Randall. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone at Heroes Aren't Hard to Find, the organizers of Heroes Con, for allowing comic culture to bring our cameras to the convention. Thanks to Cole Yarbrough and Anastasia Sidnikova for being our crew this year. Heroes Con 2020 is the third weekend of June, so mark your calendar. Thanks for watching Comic Culture. We'll see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.